Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Now, today I want to talk about Jonah. In there, in that story, I want to take a very interesting twist in the understanding of this man, Jonah, that I find so intriguing for me as a man of God and as a minister of Christ. Now, those of you who know the story in Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and he told him, go to Nineveh, he says, that great city, and cry against it, right? That great city. God called it that great city. Nineveh was fallen. There was wickedness all over. Right? But the Bible says God called it that great city. He didn't call it that wicked city. He saw what was in Nineveh. He saw Nineveh as it ought to be seen. Somebody say amen. Amen. And he says, and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me. So yes. There is greatness with this city, but their wickedness has come before me. But they are great. They are great. They are great. They are great. Now the Bible says, Jonah arose up to flee and to Tashis from the presence of the Lord. Right? Now, that, that part there gives us another twist of what you and I call the presence of the Lord. The Lord has sent him to Nineveh. And then he refuses to go to Nineveh. And then he turns onto a ship in Tarshish. And when he turns onto a ship in Tarshish, God says he left the presence. So that means that on a very large part, being in the perfect will of God concerning your life is being in the presence of God. Are you hearing me? Like prayer is being in the presence of God. There are things in scripture that define the presence of God. One of which is prayer. Right? When you pray, when you understand the life of prayer. When you understand what it means to talk to God. That is the presence of God. When you understand what it means to draw from that which is within the spiritual man, that is to be in the presence of God also. When he says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, he doesn't only talk about people who are dead or asleep in the Lord, but he's also talking about a place where sometimes we stop yielding to the pattern and living by the flesh and then start to live in the spirit by the spirit. When you live and walk in the spirit by the spirit, when you pattern your life after the spirit, you are positioning yourself in the presence of Almighty God. Somebody shout hallelujah. But one also of the other ways that defines the presence of God is doing his will, being in the perfect will of his instruction. If God says go here, Where he has sent you to go is where his presence is. Are you hearing? When you go opposite from where he is, that is like walking out of the presence of God. And that's exactly what happens to Jonah. Jonah flees to Tarshish when the Lord has sent him to Nineveh. And the Bible tells us he fled from the presence of God. That means if, for example, God has ordained me to be here, and I'm not where he has ordained me, I'm not in his presence. To a certain degree. Where has God ordained you to be? Are you hearing me? Where has God ordained you to go? Do you just wake up and go everywhere? Do you just wake up and go anywhere you want? It's like we have people in church who go everywhere they want to go. 
Today you're here, tomorrow you're there, the other day you're there, the other day you're there. But where has God ordained you to be? Where has God planted you to be? The Bible says that he that is planted in the house of the Lord, he shall what? Flourish in his courts. And he even promises your old age. He says you produce fruit. Your leaves shall not wither. Your fruit in old age shall be good and you shall be fat and flourishing. You understand? Sometimes also the presence of God is defined on where God has appointed you to sit. It's also important for you to know where has God called me to be. Has he called me to be here? Let me sit and serve. Let me live here because I've seen him there. You understand what I'm saying? You've seen an altar where you are. This is also another degree, like I said, not many people are acquainted with. That means where God sends you, there is a supply of his presence. Somebody shout hallelujah. Where God sends you, there is a full supply of his presence. So when you're at work, you're not working alone. His presence is with you because you're in the perfect will of God concerning your life. In that marriage, his presence is with you because you're in the perfect will of God concerning your life. In that business, his will, his presence is with you. In your ministry, that ministry where you are, if the Lord has called you there, he will be with you. He sustains what he calls. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, the Bible tells us he flees from the presence of God. Now, the fourth verse, which I want you to underline as a reader of the word, the Bible says, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likened to be broken. And then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. Listen, there were small gods, eh? They all cried unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it up. But Jonah was gone down in the sides of the ship. He lay and was fast asleep. The guy who is bringing all the trouble is sleeping. These guys are trying to throw things off board. And now the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thee, thy God. It's interesting that that's a capital. Yet the other ones were smaller. Arise upon and call upon thy God. If so be that God think upon us that we perish not. And they said everyone to his fellow. Come and let us cast lots. And then we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell upon Jonah. Listen. Ships just don't sink. Ships just don't sink. Water just doesn't swallow lives. It's looking for somebody. There is somebody on that boat. This is ancient wisdom. This is ancient wisdom. And one person can lead to the death of many. But when it was looking for one person. This is story in scripture. Even the men of old knew. Who used to sail ships. With thousands and thousands of nautical miles. And some spent countless months and years on, on sea. They knew. That if tempests roar and then you see waters heating abnormally to a place of sinking there is somebody on that ship that is either not supposed to be on or is off the course of god this is ancient wisdom it is not news with them are you hearing me so sometimes God just has to save that ship because of a righteous man on it. Or saves the man <laughs> who does not deserve to die. You understand what I'm saying? But see how innocent lives die because of one fellow. One fellow. Could be one or two, but it's amazing that this is a story. Praise God. And they said, everyone to his fellow, let us cast lots, so we may know whose cause this evil is. Then they said unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for who saw the cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence, from whence comest thou, and what is thy country, and of what people art thou? Man, eh? The lots fell on Jonah. These were not men who believed in God, eh? But this now was now God working in lots. Eh? <laughs> that day, when the lot was thrown, pwah, God just... <laughs> And then the Lord fell on Jonah. Who are you? Which country are you from? What have you done from, to God? What's your occupation? 
You know, all of those things are important questions. If you think more maturely, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Those are the primary questions that define blessing. Oh, curse. You understand what I'm saying? Those are the primary things that define blessing. Orcas. Whose people are you? Right? Where do you come from? Which country? What is your occupation? We want to understand. These men want to understand through the eyes of these questions where the mistake is. Indeed, when he answers, he says, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and thy dry land. And they were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because of what he had told them. They knew that a Hebrew man just doesn't die on sea. They knew it. This guy is a Hebrew. His God is the God who created the dry land and the sea. If indeed his God created the dry land and the sea and is a Hebrew, and the sea is warring against them. It's most definite he has done something. That's obvious. Because a Hebrew. And one submitted to that God. Cannot easily. Just sit on that ship. And water is roaring. And there is nothing to do with him. Do you understand what I'm saying? They asked him what shall we do to thee. He tells them throw me over the water. They had firstly hesitated. They wanted to save the life of this guy. But later on they had to give him, you know the story, and then they what? Threw him off board. And the sea ceased. It had peace. Now, when Jonah is thrown in the water, they feared the Lord God of Jonah. They even made vows and offered sacrifices. You know, that's the power of men surviving water. As in they can do anything. Now, Jonah is thrown into water. What happens? Verses 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, right? (laughs) To swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, this is an interesting fact. That the word therefore prepared, manao, is translated as appointed. Now let me explain appointing. Appointing means he told the fish, go swallow him. Now, the, some versions use words like the Lord brought a big fish and it swallowed Jonah. Right? And the word they're prepared does not fully explain what I mean. Let me explain a, a pointing. You remember in scripture when the Bible says thou shalt appoint Levites over men or people. The word therefore appoint huh, is the same word therefore prepared. Thank you for the Amplified. The Lord had prepared and appointed a great fish. Let me explain what it means. It means God literally went into the mind of this fish to tell it exactly what to do to Jonah. With the under, you see, with the understanding of what its purpose was in this. You see, you remember the prophet Balaam? He is going, Balak wants him to curse the children of Israel. And because of money, the prophet is led, because he knows he has a tongue, is led opposite from the will of God, and he wants to curse the children of Israel. But the Bible is very clear that at one particular point, his donkey crushes him on the what? He crushes his foot on the what? The side, right? And then the Bible is very clear that he was wrought in him that he smites the donkey. He hit it so bad and he drew his sword in his hand and turned aside. He wanted to kill it literally. He told the donkey, what's wrong with you? Why have you crushed my heel? You understand? And the ass or the donkey turns to him and say to him, That you see, from the time you have led me, was there a day I disobeyed you? This is a donkey. (laughs) 
Now, some of you, I don't know whether you understand how serious these matters are. But we already don't keep speaking. You understand? The Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Uh huh. Next verse. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou... Now, now Balaam, you're talking. Me already. Mm. I'm on my heels. Running 180 kilometers per hour. So Balaam says to the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there was sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the next verse says, And the ass said to Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. The donkey, okay, maybe give the message version. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your trusty donkey on whom you've ridden for years right up till now? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I? This is a donkey talking. And Balaam said, No. Common sense. Do you want to tell me the donkey doesn't know that Balaam is making a mistake? Hello? Do you want to tell me the donkey does not know? It's just speaking without a certain knowledge. God gets to a point eh, of getting so concerned with the man that he even explains to the donkey what Balaam is doing. <laughs> the donkey asks him. That means God can even use such creatures to design purpose. To align the man to his will and way. To God's will and way. But um, man, this is serious. If you think about it. That donkeys don't have spirits. Horses don't have spirits. You understand what I'm saying? Dogs don't have spirits. But if God has to save you. And align you to the will and purpose of your life. He will use a donkey to give it a little understanding and the right way to communicate or deliver or be appointed enough to serve the purpose, to draw the man or woman of God back to the will of God. Now this donkey is asking this guy, have I ever treated you a certain way? What is coming to your head as you're doing these things? You understand? Next verse. So then God helped Balaam see. What was going on? He realized that there was an angel on the way blocking the donkey. The donkey could see the angel, but Balaam could not see the angel. You understand? That's why the Bible says that the talking ass had to stop the madness of the prophet. If you don't see what I'm seeing, this is what I'm seeing. That God loves you enough to even give things animals the ability to take you to do whatever they have to do to make sure that you're doing the will of god concerning your life god has a certain attention that he gives even to such creatures that don't look like they have sense that's why the bible says that a righteous man is kind even to his beast when you see people who just wake up and then they beat beasts, they, I mean like beasts, I mean, for example, if you're directing a donkey and then you hit it so bad, it's like cows. They, yeah, cows are beaten a little, right? Ta! But there are people who hit cows so hard and you really want to say, but why are you hurting this creature? When you're righteous, even with your beast, you come with it. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. If you don't, sh- sh- just send it away. Of course, if a dog comes attacking, I also put out my, my, you understand, because it's attacking, that one we fight, but don't be hard on your beasts. Tell your neighbor, don't be hard on your beasts. Anyway, the Bible says the Lord appointed a big fish. And this big fish, what does it do? It swallows Jonah three days and three nights. The next thing we know in the next verse, I don't even know how sobering that is, but the Bible is very clear in verse 2. Jonah prayed unto the Lord God out of the fish's belly. I, he said, I cried by reason of my affliction, da, 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 long and short. The Bible says, the Lord spoke unto the fish, verse 10, and vomited out Jonah upon dry ground. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah second time, saying, chapter 3, Arise, 
go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it, preaching that which I bid thee. So Jonah that day, ah, yeah, he woke up and he said, you know what? I don't want to be swallowed again. He goes, what? And you'll understand why I'm reading the story for you. It's important for you to follow me. Now, Jonah rose, went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was exceeding a great city, three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. He cried, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people of Nineveh, in verse 5, believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on a sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them for the word came unto the king of Nineveh he arose from his throne he laid down his robe from him covered him with sackcloth sad in ashes he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and the king and his nobles saying let neither man no beast no herd no flock test anything let them not feed no drink for three days did it only the people eat also the animals were starved Man, what a serious fellow. Praise God. And the Bible says in the 10th verse, God saw their works, they turned from their evil, the Lord repented of the evil he had said and will go upon him. And you know, for some reason, God said, no, I'm not going to kill these guys, they're sorry. Chapter 4. It displeased Jonah. (laughs) Praise God. And he was very what? Angry. Very angry. Exceedingly. Right, And he prayed unto the Lord and said The message is more interesting He says And he yelled at God I knew it when I was back home I knew that this was going to happen That is why I ran off to Tarshish I knew you will share grace and mercy You're not easily angered You're rich in love and ready at the drop of a heart To turn your plans of punishment Into a program of forgiveness Somebody shout hallelujah He says, I know you. I know that you are sheer grace. And you're sheer mercy. You're not easily angered. You're rich in love. And you're ready at the drop of a heart to turn your punishment into a program of forgiveness. That is why I went to Tashish. I knew that when I prophesied, you'd not listen. You're going to have mercy on them. Now Jonah is angry. Because what he has prophesied has not come to pass <laughs> and i noticed as funny as it may sound that sometimes we are so interested in god doing what we have said to do what we have set our minds on him to do to prove our positions and place as men and ministers of the gospel who are anointed than god's program of forgiveness There are many people here right now who, if you check in their hearts, they want a certain vengeance of God to to just kill certain people and things like that. It's in you. If you search yourself in there and then you search the pages, there's a couple that said, but this guy, the way he treated me, I'm what God, come on. One day, something should happen. Something should happen. And of course it does. If it does, let it happen. If it doesn't, you know, again, vengeance is of the Lord. It's not for us. Tell your neighbor, vengeance is of the Lord. It's not for us. And as a man of God, it's not important that I've prophesied disaster and it did not come to pass. That does not make me a false prophet. Because again, even though you're prophesying disaster, he is still in the program of forgiveness we can avert it that's why i tell people if the lord shows you something that is going to happen in many instances all instances just go on your knees and pray and say god have mercy help them da 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 da. as you're speaking that all the times it's clear that god simply wants a man's intercession you understand he sought for a man are you hearing me god toward nineveh was not intending to destroy them he wanted to save them at every cost But Jonah was so engulfed in his prophetic that all he wanted was the fulfillment of what he had spoken. Says that the next time he walks into Nineveh, everybody says, Hail Jonah, prophet of God. Hail Jonah, prophet. Then they lay down things for him. Whatever he says comes to pass. Whatever he says comes to pass. To pass, to pass. Then he walks like, Hey, Ooh. sit down. 
You <gasps> smile. The prophet has spoken. The prophet, the man of God, the man of God, the man of God. If he says you're going to die, you die, you die, you die. That was, you see, and when I was reading the story, I said to see how kiddish Jonah was. And you're going to see in the next verse is how interesting this comes, right? So when Jonah becomes mad, next verse, therefore now, O Lord, take, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. Just, it is better for me to die than to, how, how do I face people and tell them that the prophetic word I gave did not come to pass? Because, ooh, Jonah still thinks it's about him. Who is following me? And the next verse says, God said, what do you have to be angry about? What is angering you? But Jonah just left. You know, I want you to think of Jonah like a little spoiled kid. And this is God the Father telling, Hey, Jonah, who are you angry about? This is him speaking. And the Kajajas. So he went out of the city of the east and sat down in a sulk. Like what? You understand? He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. You know, he's he's mad. He's so mad and he's still waiting like this. Why? This is what's in Jonah's head. Perhaps as I'm mad and sulking, somehow God will look at my anger and and say, okay, now we are friends. It's funny, but it's in scripture. And this is the prophet of God. And some people are like that. They're sulking because God didn't do something to their enemy. They're sulking because God, you know, God extended mercy to the man that was supposed to be killed or destroyed for destroying them. Let me tell you, I'm a man of God. I've been hurt. I've been hurt by people. Are you hearing me? I've also sometimes gone to bed and I said, God, but I wish this guy eats sugar and dies. The flesh. You understand what I'm saying? But this thing told me something many years ago. He says, Grace, I still have a program of forgiveness. But you see, some exceedingly become more wicked because nothing is happening to them. And God told me, look, if a man continues to be exceedingly wicked because I have not harmed them because they've hurt you, again, that's for them to pay. It's not your part. You don't know at what point they are at of maturity. Men, we have very immature, but yet mature babies. You, you understand? Some people, they are aged, yes, but they do things and you're like, oh my God. This was not called for. This is not mature. This is not so. Are you hearing me? When the Bible says, that my spiritual children for whom I travail until Christ be formed in you. How many of you know that? Give me the Amplified. The Amplified says, my little children for whom I am again suffering bath pangs until Christ completely and permanently formed, molded within you. When Paul says that I suffer like a woman suffering bath pangs for people until Christ is completely, permanently and formed, molded within them, it means that as a minister of the gospel, you learn to endure men. You learn to endure men. You just learn to endure men. Oh, anoint me, God. Give me a ministry. Give me this, God. I want to serve you. In whichever department I want to serve you. Oh, yes. And then God will give you a funny one in there. God will give you a very disturbing person. But they are also as disturbed as they are disturbing. You understand what I'm saying? The increase of Fanero comes also with the increase of mad people. Oh, we are better in numbers today. Okay, okay, okay. Speak that part. But in there, there's a wicked one in there. There's a crazy girl in there. There's a very silly boy in there. But will you be patient with him? Will you endure like a woman suffering birth pangs? Oh, no. Some of you don't understand it. Ask a woman who has given birth. Oh, ask me because I'm suffering pangs because of some people. Oh, I know how kids pain. Galatians 4.19
You know, some women say, do you know how a kid, do you know, do you know what it means to suffer pangs? Have you ever had a child? Listen, some of you, the pain we have gone through to pastor you is the same a woman feels when they're pushing. Oh, God. And God tells you that that is the pain of a minister. Those are the things you're going to go through if men have to be completely, permanently developed and grown in Christ. We labor that we might present them perfect in Christ with all wisdom. But that wisdom comes with a pain that will inflict on you. Are you hearing me? You will love a man, give him priority, and that same man will abuse you tomorrow. You will serve a man and give him your all and he will turn against you. You will, you, oh my goodness. But again, God is saying, what's your part here? Do your part. So for every man who says, I have a certain position in ministry. You know, I used to look at some people. Somebody comes and tells, you know what, Apostle, I'm quitting this department. Why? Because uh, there are some people, are, and I look at you. And you can't imagine all those, where you're quitting. I'm pastoring them. I'm the one pastoring them. Even you who is quitting. Who is understanding what I'm saying? Somebody comes and tells you, oh, you know, apostle, I, I'm tired of serving in this department. And you know how girls be. <laughs> apostle, these people have caused me pain. <sighs> And what does the Bible say? <laughs> Enduring hardship. You are a soldier of God. Hallelujah. God did not send us to righteous people. No. He sent us to wicked, wild, and crazy guys. And he tells you, you know what? You endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You don't wake up. No. The Bible says that he that taketh his hands off the plow. Is not worthy for the kingdom. You're not worthy for the realm. You're not worthy for the anointing. Some people, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave the church. You're so hard on me. What's my part? What's my part in your life as, as your pastor? Do you want me to see you got destroyed and I'm just going to look back like this because you understand what I'm saying? Do you want me to be, get so corrupted in my spirit? To get to a point to see you knocking and I just keep quiet and see you go to hell and I'm watching? No. You see, this takes a certain level of maturity. Psalms 141 verses 5. Huh? Psalms 141 verses 5. Psalm says, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. It's the kindness of God to be rebuked by a man of God. He says, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. That means if a man of God rebukes you, he's excelling the oil on your life. You're increasing in the anointing because they're rebuking you. The Bible says he rebukes those he loves. If we don't love you enough, we cannot rebuke you. But if you reprove a person, if you rebuke a man, if, if, he says he, he chastises him who he loveth. For he loveth, he chastises, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If I don't scourge you, you're not yet a son. You're a bastard. That's why the Bible says, no rebuke is his son. No. Praise the Lord. But the Bible says, but if you be without chastisement, where of your all partakers, then ye are not a son in the ministry. He don't belong here. They rebuke you and then you say, oh, 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 how could could it? One time there was a guy I called and I summoned him and I rebuked him over something. And the guy told me, who are you young man to talk to me? The guy was even younger than me. He told me, who are you to talk to me that way? I didn't abuse him. I just simply told him, man, there's a way you're going and it's not right. And I just spoke to him about, oh my goodness, the guy rebuked me. I gave it a couple of weeks. True to form, two, three years later, the fellow landed in the biggest problem I'd seen on a man his age. And I remember him coming on his knees. And he says, I plead thee by your God. Let him just give me one opportunity to make right. 
Why do you need two years and to be hit? And some of the things, the mistakes you make, some of them, they are so hard to reverse. You understand what I'm saying? Two years later, the guy comes and he says, you know, I'm sorry, da, 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 da. And, and, and then he's not just sorry because he's realized his mistake. He's sorry because he's in very, very deep trouble. Deep trouble. And what does the man of God do for giving? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But anyway, the New Living Translation says, Let the godly strike me, it will be a kindness. If they correct me, it is a soothing medicine. Don't let me refuse it. Hallelujah. He's telling God, don't ever make my head so hard to be rebuked. Let my head never get so ahead of me that I cannot listen to divine instructions. Some of you, you have leaders in those little fellowships, little small things. They tell you one thing and oh my goodness, your head hardens. No, I'm not obeying it. What? Why aren't you the one leading them? All leadership comes from God. All leadership comes from God. All leadership is ordained from God. The good and bad, the one you agree with and the one you don't. There's a reason why they're in that position and you're not. And some of you, it's the very reason why you will never go farther than where you are. Because you don't own the office higher than you. But that's the same office you want to attract. At your workplaces, you're very rude. You're, you're the Christian who quarrels most. And then they say, ah, you know what? I don't give a damn. You speak every kind of thing. And then at the end of the day, we say, promotions are coming your way. Then you say, <laughs> No, no, that's not how stuff works. Praise God, hallelujah. Are you learning something? Are you learning something? Now, let's go to the story because I don't finish. So Jonah is sulking and he's still waiting. He's sitting outside the city. But what is in his head? His head is telling him, perhaps he will look at my anger and still do what I told him, what I've said to do. So it grew over, right? Now, while Jonah is looking at the city, waiting, right, for God to destroy it, the Bible says God arranged a broad lift tree to spring up and it grew over Jonah to cool him off. He's angry. Man, God, God is amazing. (laughs) At that point, you might think God is going to get to Jonah's level and start thinking like Jonah, but here's what he does. He's dealing with a baby. He's dealing with a what? With a baby. What does he do? While Jonah is still in his crazy stupor, he just gets a broad lift tree. He's angry. He just puts, say, hey, you're angry. The sun is hitting you. Okay, let me cover it. Be angry when I'm covering you. And he still loves Jonah. And he puts shade on you, even when you're funny. And some of you think that that shade means that he agrees with you. Huh? Because the sun is not smiting you by day. You think he agrees with you. Now, it grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life. Life was looking up. And then the Bible says, God sent a worm by dawn of the next day, and the worm bored into the shade tree and it withered away. And the next verse says, And the sun came up, and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head. He started to faint. He prayed to God, I'm better off dead. Man, this guy. He's like this. Today is emotional. Tomorrow is not. Today is annoyed. Tomorrow is not. He's just like this. And then the next verse says, and then God said to Jonah, now he's trying to teach him, what right do you have to get angry about this shed tree? He asks him. Jonah said, plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. And God said, what's this? How is it that you can change your feelings, listen, from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shed tree that you did nothing to get. You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. You, it's, not, it's not your tree. You didn't plant it. You didn't, but you're still angry. Overnight. And then the next verse says, so why can't I likewise change what I feel? about Nineveh 
from anger to pleasure. You see, God is saying, if you can change from pleasure to anger, why can I not change from anger to pleasure? You understand? For him is saying, humanity begins from pleasure to anger. God is saying, I begin from anger to pleasure. So he says, likewise, can I change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city, listen, for more than 120,000 childlike babes, people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals. God even cared for the cows. Oh, you didn't get it, did you? He even cared for the innocent animals. If God can think of an innocent cow dying and he says, no, Jonah. Why should I kill these innocent people? And innocent animals. Even this goat eating on the field. God feels sorry for it and he says, "Uh uh-uh. Now, if God can feel pity of an animal, which for you, you just eat every Sunday. (laughs) God is telling Jonah what I want to tell you today. What if somebody does something to you? What if they wrong you? What if they do this and that to you? And then, and then you start waiting for your vindication and something funny to happen to them. And then you wait two, three, four, five months and they look like they're prospering. <laughs> what comes to your head? Now, sometimes you might even think, oh, maybe, maybe God, you're just fueling them to become wicked. No. Nineveh repented. The long-suffering and patience of God leadeth men to repentance. God knows at what point when this man or woman will refuse to repent. He knows when and how he will put his vengeance on them. That should never be your part. Praise God. But most importantly, I have learned by Jonah, if you look at the east wind, if you look at the worm, if you look at the fish, if you look at the tree, the gourd, all of these things, if you read the part where he speaks of the tree he planted, the word there used is appointed. If you look at the place where he sent the worm, the Hebrew word there is appointed. If you look at the place where the east wind was sent, the Hebrew word there is appointed. If you look at the big fish that swallows him, The Hebrew word there is appointed. So he appointed the fish, he appointed the worm, he appointed the tree, he appointed the east wind, and all of these things are working around the man of God to simply fulfill the will of God for his life. And now we know that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Even those who hate you are working for good. You'll ask me, but how, what good is there when a man speaks evil about me? I don't know the hows of how God makes it good, but this is how I, this is what I know. That all things work together for good even those who seem like they're putting you down all things work together for good do you love the lord are you called according to his purpose all things work together for good if they leave all things work together for good If they speak evil and then delay you, all things work together. If they disrespect you and dishonor you, all things work. If they blackmail you, slander you, and malign you, all things work together for good the sheep worked for jonah the worm worked for jonah the east wind in fact it's amazing when you go to jonah's story when god asks that question he closes the book of jonah that was the last verse and chapter of jonah it ended when jonah got the point god walked away so we see that the redemption here was not only for nineveh God wasn't just helping Nineveh. Jonah had a bigger problem. The story here does not end with Nineveh. 
the story ends when God is talking to Jonah. These things are growing you. These things are perfecting you. Open your eyes and see the good. Even in what looks so ugly. You will see that in there. There are things God is trying to do. The worm is working. To set a certain character in the minister. The fish is working. To set a certain character in the believer. The wind. The blistering heat. On the man's body. He wishes he'll faint. It's all working. To perfect this man of God Jonah. And that's when I realized that when you understand God, when you love God a certain way, I have learned this one thing that God will do everything for you to fulfill what he called you to do. It's up to Jonah to ignore all these signs, but still God is able to do anything and everything to make sure that you come back to his presence. If it will take a big fish to swallow you, you will come back to the presence. If it takes a Isnis twin to teach you a lesson, he will send it. If it takes a worm to put sense in you, he will send it. If it takes a tree to give you a shed, to give you some lesson, he will grow it. Whatever it takes, he will do everything. Jonah had a problem. One problem. He was a prophet with an ego. He was a man of God with an anger. He was trying to run something in his spirit. And God tells him, Jonah, I'm serving men through you in your weaknesses. Eh? But in the end, while I serve them, I also want to show you what you need to deal with. So thank God for his love. Thank God for his love. Just raise your hands and thank him. Thank him that he will not leave you until he fulfills his purpose in your life. Thank him that the worm worked for you, the east wind blew for you, the tree, the gourd was raised for you, the fish was for you to simply fulfill the calling of God upon your life. Even those things that work seem to work against you. There's someone here and you've asked God, why is it that I've failed to get this? It's working for your good. But Apostle, my finances have delayed. It's working for your good. I didn't get the job last week. It's working for your good. He cancelled the marriage. It's working for your good. They chose him instead of me. It's working for your good. All these things are working together for your good for your good all for me take a minute and talk to God all for me
God give you sound wisdom and grace. And indeed, may you be patient and trust Him on your walk to perfect you even as you serve Him and live for Him. And I pray for you, most importantly, that He will give you wisdom to discern when the God comes on your head to teach you. When the worms eat the God to teach you. That you will get the understanding and discern when the east wind is teaching you something. That it will not be a wind for you to look at as judgment, but that you will discern fully his mind and intent in this. That you should not wait for a big fish to throw you where you have to, but that if you if you refuse, that at least let him send that fish. We, we don't all want the weed, we don't all want the fish, we don't all want the, the worm, we don't want the tree, we don't want any of that. But if it has to take God to do whatever he has to do, for you to stay in his presence, let him do it. Let him do it. Because he's God. In Jesus' name we've prayed and believed. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.